Thanks very much, Graham. It's a terrific introduction, and um, what an inspirational speaker to come after, so Ray, it's quite a, quite a challenge. Um, I always feel it's a bit of an irony being an Australian and being invited to speak about governance, having come, coming from a country that is somewhat over-governed with our three layers of government, and uh, being in a nation where I think your governance structures put you at a significant advantage with, um, with one less layer. I also didn't realise, though, and this is far more intimidating, that you also have a nation with the um, greatest numbers of, number of rocket scientists. So, you know, nothing should be an issue. Nothing should be, um, should be a problem in terms of what New Zealand um, could achieve. Uh, but going to the point of, um, of governance, uh, I think, as Graham said, I've got experience in the um, public sector. My current role is a Deputy Secretary in the Department of Ag and Water Resources. We change our department names regularly, but that's what we are at the moment. And um, my role is to look after the biosecurity part of um, the, the department. So um, basically, you're equivalent in terms of running biosecurity, and we're just going to stick with the branding of biosecurity because our department name changes far too often. Probably not something you guys have to grapple with as, as frequently as, uh, as we do. But my experience and background, I've um, spent a considerable time in the public sector. I've spent some time out in the private sector. Um, I'm involved in some not-for-profits and NGOs um, and um, been on a number, well, held a number of directorships over my, my time and my career. And when I reflect on what all that means in terms of governance, I mean, to, to me, it's really about collaboration. And this is something I was going to say even before listening to, to Saray and the collaboration and bringing the power of all of the people together focused and aligned on interests. I mean, that sounds incredibly simple, um, it, but it is, and in the end, it always comes down to the mix of people and less about structures and setups and all of those things. It comes down to people, that those people have an aligned interest, that they respect each other's roles, because um, frequently when you're a regulator talking to industry, you have very different roles and very different incentives, but there's a need to respect each other's roles, and the real power is that power of collaboration. So to amplify that today, I want to talk a little bit about the Australian experience, um, and talk a bit about biosecurity in Australia. With a few examples, I think we have a lot in common, but there are some areas where we possibly have some differences as well. So first of all, the biosecurity system in Australia is based on a model of shared responsibility. Probably not a lot unlike what you want to achieve with your 4.7 New Zealanders. By shared responsibility, we mean that the federal government has a role, the state governments have a role, industry has a role, academia has a role, science has a role, everyone has a role, farmers and producers have a role, and therefore we refer to it as a model of shared responsibility. As I mentioned, there are several tiers of governance, federal, state and territory, and local. And I'll mention in a minute some of what those governance arrangements are. And all of it requires strong leadership, but also, very significantly, collaboration. <coughs> the size of the job, and I think Deborah ran through some of your stats and data. I mean, ours, ours isn't dissimilar. The size of the challenge is growing. Um, there's more and more mail articles coming through. Um, we seize and destroy, treat or export 23,000 goods um, each year. Now, Wharfgate container inspections are going, going up. Um, visitor numbers are going up, 8 million visitor arrivals up 10.9%. We also have 60,000 uh, kilometres of coastline, of which 10,000, which is a, quite a difference to New Zealand in the sense that 10,000 of our kilometres of coastline is in northern Australia, which is a much more tropical zone. Um, than what New Zealand experiences, which simply means that we have a, a greater and much more vast variety of possible pests and diseases when you include those that are uh, in the tropical northern zone. And I think, though, despite all of those challenges, both Australia and New Zealand largely remain sort of pest and disease free and are the envy of the world in terms of our um, biosecurity systems and our pest-free status. Some of that, we've got natural advantages for sure. We've both got geography in terms of being island nations. Um, but we also ought to acknowledge that it's more than that. 
We, we actually do have very strong biosecurity systems, both Australia and New Zealand, and they are the world envy. We, we are world's best at biosecurity. Doesn't mean that we should now rest on our laurels, there's plenty more to be done, but we should acknowledge success where it is in terms of currently, we are both world's best in terms of our biosecurity arrangements. Australia's approach to biosecurity, it's, it's a risk-based approach. You know, we went through and uh, someone earlier talked about a, a particular period of our history um, where we were doing 100% inspection rates. No one can do that anymore. It's just absolutely impossible. The only way forward is a risk-based approach. That means that you've got to invest in science and you've got to have your science leading that risk-based approach. You've got to invest in research. You've got to invest in um, intelligence to be able to inform that risk-based approach. And most of all, you need to be agile because the risks are changing. Um, everything is changing incredibly frequently and you need the ability to be fairly agile while still having that measured risk-based approach. And uh, Andrew from SEPRA spoke earlier and uh, he's a great collaborator of ours and also with New Zealand to help inform what those risks are and therefore what the treatments, et cetera, that we should be, be performing are. Um, our activities, we do all the usual sort of biosecurity activities of preventing, preparing, detecting. Predominantly, we want to move as much of the risk or prevent the risk whilst offshore as best we can. Um, I'm sure that's the same as your model, but certainly any investment offshore is far better than having an incursion um, onshore. All of that we do in collaboration with industry the Australian government, the federal government's got a strong role in leadership and, and coordination. Um, from our industry perspective, and it's slightly different to yours, Deborah ran through um, earlier in the day your stats about import, export, etc. We're by far a net exporter of our agricultural products, so it's about 45 billion worth of value a year to the Australian economy, our, um, our agricultural products. And we export two thirds of basically what we grow and, uh, and produce. So we see industry as a very strong player um, and they see biosecurity as their insurance policy for that ability to export. We are never as a, a country, as a high wage economy that Australia is, we're never gonna compete on you know, low price commodities. We're never going to um, be able to compete on necessarily huge volumes either. Our competitive market is about quality, and quality goes to being underpinned by good biosecurity. So our industry um, partners very much see themselves as collaborators in the space, and that biosecurity is part of the insurance policy. They could also be pretty strong advocates to, uh, to government to ensure that there is a solid uh, investment in biosecurity. So our partnership arrangements, a bit about how we, uh, we work with industry and how we work across um, our multiple government areas. Firstly, we have a wonderful document called the Intergovernmental Agreement on Biosecurity. Now, you have to be a public servant to have dreamt that name up, an intergovernmental agreement. It's basically an agreement between the federal governments and all of the state governments um, about who will do what and how we will work together in terms of achieving um, a pest and disease free status. Our first intergovernmental agreement was stuck, struck in 2012, following a very significant review that was done of the Australian biosecurity system in 2008. And that review said we needed to do three things. One was get, get it written down with the states about who's to do what and how much of it and how we'll work together. And that was the intergovernmental agreement then struck in 2012. The other two things, it said many more than two, but I can only ever think of three things at any one time. So it said get an agreement with the states and territories, get yourself a new piece of legislation and get yourself some decent analytics. That's fundamentally what the 2008 review. So in 2012, we got the uh, intergovernmental agreement struck. Um, it, we then produced a new piece of legislation, a new Biosecurity Act, and we implemented that on the 16th of June this year. Um, it replaced the Quarantine Act of 1908, so it was a long time between drinks and pieces of legislation. Things had changed a lot between 1908 and uh, 2016, a long time to wait for new legislation. So we did get ourselves a new piece of legislation which we implemented on 16 June fairly seamlessly 
And then um, the last one of those recommendations, which was get yourself a decent analytics tool, uh, we finally um, this year got the funding from government to be able to develop that um, analytics tool. And I spent yesterday with your um, MPI uh, staff members having a talk about what you do for analytics and how we can work together because we now finally um, have a great investment opportunity and I think you know there's a lot of collaboration and sharing that we can do between Australia and New Zealand. Um, we also have, as well as the, um, our partnership arrangements, we've got the intergovernmental agreement, so that's how the Commonwealth and states play together. We also have a body called the National Biosecurity Committee, or NBC, for those who like acronyms and jargon. Um, that committee uh, is chaired by the Commonwealth and has all of the states on it. It reports to the ministers, so we have agriculture ministers, one for each state and each territory and uh, one federal one. Um, this National Biosecurity Committee is, if you like, the highest level committee focusing on biosecurity uh, nationally. And um, yeah, so it's basically the states of players. And I was pleased to invite New Zealand to join that National Biosecurity Committee. I um, sent you a letter, Roger, last week inviting you to join. And uh, that was an initiative that came out of a regular cl collaboration that we have in biosecurity between Australia and New Zealand. And we were having a discussion in Melbourne a few months ago and um, raised this topic, hmm, why not uh, join our National Biosecurity Committee and become a participant? So New Zealand has now been invited to join our highest level national um, committee for greater collaboration. Emergency response arrangements, and um, you, I think you talk about them to some extent as your GIAs, uh, we have a number of what we call deeds, and we have long acronyms for each of the different types of deeds, but we have a number of deeds in place that are deeds with Commonwealth, state and industry that set in place the cost sharing arrangements if there is an incursion, and it also means that we can respond instantly knowing that we're responding with industry. At the moment, we've got a response agreement or a deed uh, in the animal area, a response in the plant area, and a deed in the environment area. And we're now looking at developing one in the marine and aquatic um, new emerging area, and we plan to have that deed in place before middle of next year. What those deeds do for us, it give, gives certainty. It gives certainty that we can get on. It gives certainty that we can get on and respond. What it does for industry, it means that industry is part of the decision-making process about responses, including being part of the decision-making process about when we say, you know, you can't eradicate, we just need to be able to sort of transition this into ongoing management. So I find the, the deeds, and, and yes, there's an awful lot of um, paperwork and rules around it and all of that, but I think they're an absolutely fundamental piece of our response um, arrangements that have a seat at the table for industry and industry are part of the decision making when we go into any response arrangement. Interestingly, in terms of our deeds, the very first of our deeds uh, was up and running with the um, animal area, so meat industries, etc., uh, and was set up 20 years ago. So um, I think our animal um, industry areas led the way in terms of getting our deeds and our response arrangements um, in place. So um, also SEBRA, I mentioned SEBRA before is our collaboration with the University of Melbourne that Andrew um, spoke about in providing us uh, with an opportunity to look at some, what some of our modelling and risk-based approaches and other challenges we face in uh, biosecurity. Some Briefly some other co um, current partnership arrangements that are all about improving outcomes. Um, I mentioned that we're underway with negotiating an aquatic response deed. We're also looking at one for exotic weeds. Um, we support a One Health arrangement, so that's between um, ourselves and human health in terms of looking at what might be potential zoonotic diseases that go from the animal to the human barrier. We collaborate strongly on antimicrobial resistance. Um, we run a number of preparedness exercises and many of those we all run jointly with New Zealand as well. 
And we're working on strategies to improve our preparation and response for specific threats. For example, one of the strategies that we're working on right now is looking at tramp ants and how to very significantly reduce tramp ant incursions. We've um, had some successes with our tramp ants recently. We have one called the red-imported fire ant. They have great names, those ants. Somebody was showing them before, you know, yellow crazy ants, all these different great names. Um, we have one called the red-imported fire ant. And uh, I think about oh, a good decade or so ago, someone decided it wasn't worth eradicating or attempting to eradicate when there was a relatively minor incursion. And now we have a colony in southeast Queensland that's quite well established. We've spent the last 10 years just limiting it to making sure that it you know, doesn't get any further than that patch in southeast Queensland. And um, finally, all our governments have decided that it's worth giving one really good shot to eradicate red imported fire ants. But as a contrast, the cost to eradicate, once it's taken hold, the cost to eradicate is about 380 million over 10 years to eradicate that area in southeast Queensland. To kill off a brand new incursion, and we had one in um, Port Botany, quite some way separate, geographically separate to Queensland, but we had an incursion in Port Botany recently, and to get on top of it immediately and early, it cost us $1 million to eradicate, versus waiting for it to get established, and 380 million later, you know, you're, you're looking at a massive budget. So, acting quickly, and being able to respond quickly. And we find that those agreements with industry give us the capability to respond quickly, ends up saving you an enormous amount of money. Um, other partnership agreements, engaging more with environmental stakeholders. I was very impressed with your Department of Con Conservation and um, their interest in activism and contribution to biosecurity. Um, that's not something we enjoy as much of in Australia, and it's an area that we know we've got to work on. So we're uh, doing some more work in terms of with our environmental stakeholders so that um, we pay attention to things that are of environmental concern. Peri-urban sectors, one of our jurisdictions has played, paid some considerable attention to what we call the sort of peri-urban boundary. So this is the boundary around your sort of city, but before you get to the sort of ag sector, typically inhabited by hobby farmers, um, and they are an increasing biosecurity risk. Um, we have spent a lot of time and effort in Australia, and particularly in uh, New South Wales, in improving on-farm biosecurity. A lot of measures and a lot of investment, and it's pleasing to see that many farmers now in Australia have got really good on-farm biosecurity practices. Many of our industry bodies have very strongly promoted on-farm biosecurity as a terrific you know, barrier to make sure that you're managing your own farm well and the biosecurity measures with your farm. As the peri-urban sort of world encroaches into the production sector world, um, there is an emerging risk there in terms of biosecurity not taken quite so seriously um, by people who are in more of that sort of hobby farmer zone. So that's one of those emerging um, areas of interest. I think too with our um, Commonwealth state arrangements, um, one of the opportunities, one of the few advantages, and when you deal with Commonwealth and multiple states, you've got to look for the advantages. One of the advantages that we have is that our various states will try to do something a bit different to each other, and then they'll compete with each other, all of which lifts the level. Um, two of our states recently, to support the strengthening on-farm biosecurity measures, have actually introduced new biosecurity legislation, and as part of that, they've introduced what they've called a general biosecurity obligation, which is actually an obligation on anyone who goes onto the farm to observe the on-farm biosecurity practices. And it's a, it's a terrific thing. I mean, it's sort of unseen how many people go onto farms, you know, people to go and check meters, read things, install telecoms, all of that. They are now in those two states subject to a general biosecurity um, obligation and that is to observe the on-farm practices uh, which that, that, that particular farmer has decided for their on-farm biosecurity measures. So I think that's quite a, a significant step forward in the maturity of the biosecurity model. Recent developments that we've had? No? Recent developments. Um, we have recently agreed uh, and this has taken some significant time to agree it, but with the assistance of our state 
territories and also Plant Health Australia, we have agreed on our top 40 plant pests of concern. We used to have the top, I don't know, 135, 165, 700 and however many, um, but we felt we needed to narrow it to give some significant focus to those particular pests and diseases, the pathways, the prevention me measures, just the ability to focus on a lesser number than the thousands of things that could come. And so we have developed our top 40 less list of pests and diseases. And I have to say, it actually has delivered results in terms of focusing specifically on those 40s. What are the vectors? What are the pathways it can come here? You know, what are the treatments? What is, what's the R&D we need to invest in to build resistant strains? Um, all of those. It's been quite a, quite a turning point, more so than the simplistic idea of just having a top 40 list. Um, I mentioned too recently we've got the Biosecurity Act that commenced in June this year and was a highly successful implementation. We took that opportunity in developing the legislation to undertake some really significant consultations. So um, perhaps it was a little bit like the consultations that you've had in putting together your strategy. Um, we had that opportunity with our new biosecurity um, legislation. And it basically means that we've, got, we've replaced our outdated 1908 um, legislation with a much more flexible, um, modern and responsive piece of, of legislation. We've also uh, enjoyed in um, Australia the opportunity of having our minister, who is also the Deputy Prime Minister, and who is a significantly committed um, ad agricultural advocate, he has championed the formation of what's called an agricultural competitiveness white paper, not a, another bit of a mouthful, but fundamentally what it means is a greater investment in biosecurity. So we have seen finally, and this is the method by which we got our analytics money, we have finally seen some of the investment that had been called for back when the uh, last review of back in 2008 was undertaken. But it has meant some really, some additional funding to look at strengthening surveillance, our scientific capability, our information and analysis, um, and our community-based action, um, which you also heard a bit about today from the New Zealand perspective. Um, and look, you know, I think um, we can all share in the things that we would have liked to have uh, not have arrived, but we should also share in some of the eradication success stories that um, each of us have had. And I've just mentioned a number of them there on, on that slide. We've also got a number of long-term eradications underway that I won't call success yet, but I mentioned the red imported fire ants that we're going to be uh, really having a, a good hit at. And also uh, things like that. We had a recent capra beetle um, incursion which could have been disastrous for our stored grain industries, but we were able to get on top of that really, really quickly. And I would say that the grain industry's response was immediate and in totally in concert with us um, based on having had that deed in place and each of us knowing what our respective roles were and um, getting on with things uh, immediately. So um, just want to mention that um, you know, in terms of our work with New Zealand, there's a very strong collaboration across the Tasman. There's a lot of things that we do together. And um, just a, a few things. Um, we share a strong working relationship. Each year we get together to uh, share what we're doing. Um, that'll be more frequent now with, the Na with New Zealand joining the National Biosecurity Committee. Um, your New Zealand Minister is part of the Ministerial Council, the Australian Ministerial Council, when we get the Australian Federal Minister and State Ministers together. And that's a terrific, again, opportunity for um, sharing and collaborating. So there's quite a number of things that we do in, um, in collaboration. There's work that we're both doing in, in food standards, in fumigation, uh, the good old brown marmorated stink bugs that got mentioned several times today, we're now trying to deal with that at source, so offshore. Um, work we're collaborating on simple things like sea container hygiene so that we reduce the number of hitchhiker pests and also in that in intelligence and, um, and analysis. So we look forward to a continuing strong relationship to continue the development of a modern and responsive biosecurity system 
And we are, both of us, world leading in what we do here. We just need to absolutely keep it that way. Fundamental to that is, again, in relation to that governance debate, you know, working together, working in partnership, partnership with industry, you know, partnership with 4.7 million New Zealanders, um, the sharing and the respect in terms of the different roles that a regulator plays versus a role that industry plays, that sort of respect should underpin um, maintaining the current system and indeed improving on it. So thank you very much.